Welcome to Simply Box, the podcast, the podcast exploring the animation industry one episode at a time. I'm your host, Monique. You can find me on all social media platforms at Simply Robotics, S-I-M-P-L-Y-R-O-B-O-T-I-X. When listening to the show, use the hashtag Simply Robotics Pod to join in on the conversation. Now, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, and because I too am... Hispanic. I am an Afro-Latina. This is not an identity I lead with. And I will just say long story short, it's because obviously it's not a perceived identity because of the color of my skin. And then also because I'm not fluent in Spanish, I haven't always felt as confident identifying as an Afro-Latina, identifying as a Hispanic person. Um, It's always just been much easier to identify as a Black American uh, part, a significant part of my family is African American, Black American, a significant part of my family is West Indian, and then the third significant part of my family is Hispanic. So um, it's just easier just to have identified as Black and a Black American and West Indian, but definitely uh, in my later adult years, I've been finding more comfort identifying as an Afro-Latina. So I I also, it's worth mentioning that I'm going to be a part of a conversation on October 15th with Rise Up Animation. So you have to go to their Instagram. Eventually, they're going to have some promotional materials about it. But on October 15th, I was invited by Latinx and Animation to have that conversation about being of Hispanic and Latin identity and in the animation industry. So I'll be probably talking way more about all that sort of stuff but his a hispanic heritage month month always gets me talk not talking but necessarily like thinking and reflecting about my identity and my connection to this this culture like my culture and so it only felt right to talk about this film which is chico and rita because i love 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 it and you're going to hear why. So IMDb quickly summarizes this film as Chico is a young piano player with big dreams. Rita is a beautiful singer with an extraordinary voice. Music and romantic desires unite them, but their journey in a tradition of the Latin ballad, the bolero, um, brings heartache and torment. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So what's important to note is that this film is about Afro-Cuban yeah, so they're like in jazz, a jazz uh, musician, jazz singer, and they're Afro-Cuban. So this, which I'm going to get into later, let's just keep it moving. <laughs> Chico and Rita first um, premiered or debuted or was released in the United Kingdom November 9th, 2010. Then it was released in Spain February 25th, 2011. And then finally it was released in America November 11th, 2011. It's important noting that I believe Walt Disney Pictures had distribution rights to it over in the UK and in Spain. And then G-Kids, which is a huge deal, you know, a lot of Miyazaki films and a lot of like anime or in, and international feature films were able to see in North America, meaning Canada, America, I want to say Mexico, but I'm not too sure about Mexico. We're able to see a lot of international animated films because of G-Kids getting the distribution rights for it. Keeping it moving. On the internet, I was seeing like, not a lot, but sometimes I would see three directors. Sometimes I'll see two directors. So I can't completely be sure. But I definitely saw these two men consistently, even in the interviews that I watched. And that's Tono Arando and Javier Mariscal. Production companies are Fernando. I don't know if this is English or Spanish, but it says Fernando. So Fernando Truba PC, Estudio Mariscal, and Magic Light Pictures. So it's also important to note that Chico and Rita won the Goya Award for Best Animated Film at the 25th Goya Awards. Now, I didn't even know Goya had an award show. I don't know where you can watch it, when it comes on. I don't know anything about it, but I shall find out. Chico and Rita was also nominated for an Oscar for the Best Animated Feature Film at the 84th Academy Awards. I don't know what year that is, but I'm thinking it was 2012. And this was the first nomination for a Spanish full-length animated film. Okay, big 
deal. So now um, I'm getting most of this information from Wiki. We're just going to talk about the plot a little bit. The movie starts off in present day Havana. And I believe that at this time, this is like the late 80s, early 90s um, present day Savannah, Savannah, <laughs> Havana. Chico is a shoe shiner right? He tunes his radio to this radio station, which starts playing some old Cuban hits. And he hears this song called A Taste of Me, also known as Sabor a Mi. And it causes him to start reflecting back on his life in Cuba during the 1940s. In 1948, in Havana, Chico and his best friend Ramon um, were struggling dandies. Now, I saw a picture in my Googles of what a dandy is, and it seems like kind of like a big dude kind of fancy pants person but um it's like you're a big fish in a small pond almost kind of sort of thing but i highly suggest you google that word for yourself so there are struggling dandies in a low life bar <laughs> ramon arranges for a double date with himself and chico with these two white american tourists they take the women to this bar and that's where chico lays his eyes on the lead singer of this band and her name is rita so Chico, you know, being a little Rico Suave, uh, is attempting to talk to Rita, but there ends up being some, I don't know, activity, energy, if you will, with some other American tourists. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so between that night where Chico and Rita first meet, a whole bunch of stuff happens. And Rita ends up getting the opportunity to go to New York City, and she takes that opportunity. Now, as I go through the plot, I am definitely going to be skipping a lot of stuff because I really don't want to spoil this. I love this movie so much and so deeply, and I want you all to experience it for yourselves if you choose to and not go into it so much with spoilers, just with my own excitement, you know? So after Rita leaves, Chico becomes a bit depressed and he and Ramon, I'm saying Ramon, it's Ramon, eventually secure some means to go to New York City and try their luck at fame and fortune too. Chico and Ramon end up meeting this jazz musician called Chano Pozo. Chano Pozo's sister gave them a letter of recommendation and Chano is super respect receptive to it and he's just excited to meet some other Cubans. But, <laughs> but Chano is involved in a lot of activity if you catch, catch my drift, you know, if you, if you follow along. So I'm just going to leave that there, okay? Chico ends up finding work as a party musician and Ramon is an usher at the Plaza Hotel. At one of Chico's party gigs, he runs into Rita after like all these years. And she's in a very sensitive place because she overheard basically some white people being a bit racist about the fact that she may not be able to carry this film that she's in and that the film may essentially flop. So some more things happen. Some more times pass. All right. Some more time passes. <laughs> And Chico ends up getting deported to Cuba right at the beginning of Castro's regime. So the new Cuban revolutionary authorities seize Chico's passport. And now all of the venues are forbidden to play jazz because it's the imperialist music. So now Chico being disappointed with life, you know, he got deported from America. He's back in Cuba. He has no passport. He can't do jazz music and jazz music is what he loves. He just decides to give up music altogether. So some more things happen and then the film ends. <laughs> and that's as, about as much as I can share with you because it's just it's just such a good movie. It's such a good experience. I cannot give more details away. Like I can't I just can't do it. I'm sorry. So as we said, Chico is a young um, piano player with dreams. Rita, she's a beautiful singer, like, you know, that has just like grand ambitions for herself. Both of them, you know, I, I can't even get into too much detail about the other characters because I feel like it would be spoilers. And we don't do. Yes, we do do that over here. <laughs> I absolutely do spoilers and I don't mind doing spoilers. So let me talk about the visual style a little bit. It's super flat with um black outlines it's very similar to the show archer if you all have ever seen it um i mean there's a lot of cartoons that have 
basically flat colors and black outlines, but Archer comparison makes the most sense because it's Archer kind of gives like a more realistic human approach to their style without going straight into like hyper realism like video games, you know? So I also learned by doing some research that this team took a trip to Havana, Cuba. And although a lot of the buildings have been like decayed and and destroyed and stuff like that, the filmmakers were able to access an archive of photos to help them recreate Havana for this film. And when you watch this film, I feel like they, they really did a really good job at bringing old Havana to life, even though (laughs) I was nowhere close to being born during the time period that this was taking place. I mean, my parents weren't even born. (laughs) I'm pretty sure my grandparents were still doing their own migrations, you know, but watching this, the colors, I I feel like, I don't know, they seem pretty true to the time periods that they were taking place. Um, I definitely noticed, obviously, the one thing about Havana, Cuba is the cars. So, like, those cars were accurate. But then also, as the movie starts off and sometimes cuts back to Chico in present day, which is the late 80s, early 90s, the cars in those scenes, too, are, like, pretty accurate to the time period. So, anyways, the pictures that the team found provided much historical information about Cubans of that era from their clothes, their faces, the streets, billboards, cars, bars, just the way they lived. And I feel like, like I said, that it really provided that like authenticity to their visual depiction. I also think that it was pretty cool how they depicted the jazz scene in New York City in the late 40s, early 50s. Like, I don't know. I do like jazz, but there's just something about Latin jazz that is just invigorating. But jazz is invigorating in itself. But I think it's like a little bit of like some of the drums, right? The Latin drums, which is all just the diaspora once you think about it. It's all just different forms of diaspora. But like, I just love the Harlem Renaissance and I love like what what Black Americans were doing in New York in that time period just seems really cool and amazing. They also, I think, I have no idea, seem to have done a good job with Las Vegas is is in is represented in this film and seeing how black artists had to navigate being the star allegedly, but not being treated as a star, if you know what I mean. And then also they had a moment where they were showing what it was like for black performers overseas because they had a moment where they were in Paris as well. So that's why I can't I can't let you know how they got to Paris, what they were doing in Paris, but they got there. (laughs) Um, There were some 3D elements that obviously had tune shaders, like, for instance, the cars. I think some of the actual I'm saying sets had some 3D action in it because the camera will kind of turn or like pan a little bit and we would see, I just feel like it's very hard. Not that it's impossible, it's just very hard and time consuming to draw that kind of subtle, but yet uh, significant subtle, but yet significant camera movement that's just easier to have a 3D camera make that turn a little bit and then you have your flat characters on top of it, you know? So... Anywho, that was that. The animation style is 2D. It looks like there's a bit of rotoscoping. And for those of you who do not know what rotoscoping is, it's essentially when you have like a video layer of something um, and animators would animate on top of the video layer, be it like with computers before they used to literally put like pen and paper and project like a video image onto a surface and put pen and paper on that surface and trace it because sometimes like the animation is very good. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like they definitely use a lot of live video footage for a reference, especially with some of the dancing scenes. Now in the show notes, I have a bunch of links for you because like I said, I love this movie. And so I found some like NPR, like an interview an NPR, review and some like a YouTube interview but in this particular NPR interview director Fernando I can't pronounce his name I should ask my mother uh, Truba Trueba Truba Trueba <laughs> um Fernando T I'm gonna call him um says some of the following things that such as animation has some of the qualities that classic old movies had such as a more concise 
and more synthetical way of storytelling. He also says that most of the time, modern directors are obsessed with making fiction, well, which looks like a documentary. Sometimes it's very well done, but I think that it's kind of a waste of time because fiction must be something else. But I think most people are afraid of telling stories and they are afraid of the audience not buying them and not believing them. I really, really appreciated that statement. He also said that he wanted the movie to feel like a bolero, which I, I mentioned earlier. Boleros, are, he says, are very tragic, no? Always losing your love and getting together again and losing it again. So we try to give the movie the same so- sort of structure as the song where they are losing each other and uh, finding each other. And they're using all of the conventions, the sentimental stuff, the tragic center of the bolero in the movie so that's why chico and rita are always losing each other now coming down to my final thoughts since i have seen this film so many times at this point when i watched it recently specifically to record this episode i found myself just zoning out and just enjoying what was on my screen and how the spanish language sounds to my ear as well as the music like i was wasn't even always reading the subtitles like i would be like Ugh, i got to actually pay attention you know um this movie makes me really miss traveling to latin and hispanic countries even more often than before and especially because of covid like I went to Cuba a couple years ago. I loved it. I went to Costa Rica a couple years ago. I also loved it. For me, going to like Central America and South America, um, South America always makes me feel like I'm in some odd way returning to myself. And I think that's heavily because like I'm still working through my identity as an Afro-Latina person or individual or Afro-Latina um, so going back to those places, even though that's not where my my family's from, my Latin family is from Venezuela. But even though I haven't been to Venezuela as recently as I've been to these other countries, I still feel like, again, like, like diaspora connection. So like this movie just made me really, really miss being in those countries, man. Uh, it's also worth noting that there is some nudity in this film. This is an adult animated film. And I don't think the nudity was necessary or helped drive the story at all. It did not move the story forward. Everything could have still happened with, uh, basically, no, I don't like, am I, do I say it? Do I not say it? Everything could have happened with the character being clothed, right? So I probably would always feel a way when only a black woman is nude on screen in a movie in a tv show whatever and if her male counterpart is not also just as nude i'm gonna feel a way about it i'm probably always gonna feel a way about it when it's a black woman and the person in charge of her being nude is not a black woman I'm always going to feel a way about it if the person in charge is a man i'm always going to feel a way about it if the person in charge of a black woman being nude is not a black man either and is a white man, you know? It just doesn't sit well with me. And I'm positive that it stems from the fact that black bodies are often and were often and black women bodies were portrayed and treated as, you know, just some form of consumption for everybody else. You know, you hear this term like the male gaze a lot. So when seeing this character nude on the screen, I was like, what, who, like, who is this for? What is this for? What does this have to do with anything? Like, I think it's just to prove that this is not for children, but there are so many other things in terms of the themes that's presented in this movie, the, the visual things that happen in this movie that make it not for children. I don't think this nudity. I mean, and it's not graphic. I should be clear. It's not graphic nudity. Um, maybe they were trying to be more artistic with it, um, but it just wasn't necessary. And I just feel like, you know, I just wish the the nudity didn't didn't exist. And it was it was tasteful for the most part, but like it just wasn't wasn't needed. So I say all that to say. I would love if you watch Chico and Rita and tell me what you think about it. And if you end up not liking it, we could talk about it. I 
cannot say that I've interacted with someone that has watched this and didn't like it. So you could be the first person. I haven't had animation news for a long time, but I got something today. I didn't even read all of it, but Lion King 2, the full live action animated remake will be directed by Barry Jenkins, who's the director of Moonlight. This is interesting because the director of the first animated live action, The Lion King, was a white man. So they got a black man to do it this time. And I wonder if that's supposed to make things better because it takes place in Africa, right? But I don't think a second Lion King is needed. I don't think the first Lion King was needed. It was fine just being a regular animated and not this hyper-realistic animated thing, right? And also, I was talking with a young lady on Twitter who was saying like, oh, I hope Barry got paid a lot of money to do this so that he can make a different project. And I was saying that like, I wish it didn't come to that. I wish we didn't have to have movies we don't want as viewers just so that we can have view- movies that we want essentially you know just so that directors and producers and other people can make the products that they want to make but they have to do stuff like the lion king 2 fake live action stuff like no absolutely not so anyways (laughs) that concludes this week's simply robotics the podcast i want to thank you all for listening i want to thank you for sharing the show I'm going to start having guests like my mental health is coming back to me, you know, step by step, day by day. It's 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 coming. (laughs) And um, I'm starting to I've been reaching out to people, but I'm going to start scheduling these things and like, let's get a little backlog going. I have some great, great news to share, but I'm not sure where or when exactly to share it. If you listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, uh, rate the show. You know, I would appreciate it. If you don't, just share the show with some people you know. You know, when you see me post about the show, like, like it, <laughs> retweet it, repost it in your IG stories. I would greatly appreciate that. Um, I think that's everything. So once again, you can find me on all social media platforms at Simply Robotics. The website is simplyrobotics.com. And lastly, I have a whole bunch of links in the show notes for you to watch stuff. You can watch the trailer for Chico and Rita. You can watch some of the interviews that I watched. And um, yeah, just until next time. Bye.